Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today for the Innovations in Preservation Latino, Latina, Latinx Heritage Session. My name is Salem Mota Casper, and as the Executive Director of Latinos in Heritage Conservation, an organization that is deeply committed to the advocacy and public education on preserving Latinx heritage sites, I'm delighted to serve as a moderator for this panel. As we gather virtually for Pass Forward and this session, I invite each of us to acknowledge the Native peoples whose ancestral homelands we currently occupy. I reside in Bastrop, located in Central Texas, and wish to recognize and honor its original stewards, including the Tonkawa, Sana, Apache, Guadalupecan, and others. Recognizing this land is an expression of gratitude and of appreciation to those whose territory we reside on and a way of honoring the indigenous peoples who have been living and working on the land from time immemorial. Land acknowledgements do not exist in the past tense or historical context. Colonialism is current and an ongoing process. And let us celebrate the ancestral grounds and extend our gratitude to these nations. As we come up the heels of Hispanic Heritage Month, ending just two weeks ago, for me, this conversation is both exhilarating and a time of deep reflection. It's a time where we celebrate the accomplishments of Latinx communities, elders, leaders, and activists, and those doing great work to preserve our thriving and living history. What are creative and innovative ways that folks are preserving Latinx heritage? How are we creating a practice that is centered on people and community? And what can building trust with Latinx communities look like within the field of historic preservation? In this session, we'll hear from four remarkable leaders who will help answer these questions and share their great work in finding new and innovative ways to preserve Latinx history. First, we'll hear from Shannon Stage. Shannon is the manager of grants and preservation services at Historic Denver. In her role, Shannon manages the Action Fund program and outreach engage engagement for historic districts, including the recently created La Alma Lincoln Park Historic District, which we'll hear more on. She also manages the State Historical Fund grants and the Facade Easement program. Shannon seeks equity within the field by ensuring that all of Denver's community stories are told. And with that, I will pass it on to Shannon. Thank you, Sela. And as she mentioned, my name is Shannon Stage and I am the Manager of Grants and Preservation Services at Historic Denver. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with Historic Denver, we are a preservation nonprofit here in Denver, Colorado. And uh, next slide. Today I'll ta be talking to you a little bit about the La Alma Lincoln Park Historic Cultural District, uh, telling you a little bit about the history of the neighborhood, historic Denver's role in this effort, as well as, of course, the community involvement. Next slide, please. This land and space we are talking about today was once occupied by various native tribes, including the Ute, Comanche, Arapaho, and Cheyenne peoples, who lived in seasonal encampments along the South Platte and Cherry Creek. We would like to start off by acknowledging this, but it is also important to note that we acknowledge this throughout the historic context effort as well as the historic cultural district effort. In 1858, when gold was discovered in nearby Cherry Creek and South Platte River, European immigrants from the East Coast, as well as Hispano and Mexican American families began to settle along the riverbanks, quickly transforming this vital indigenous uh, migratory route into the town of Auraria and Denver. The land we now know as La Alma Lincoln Park uh, was plotted by Alexander C. Hunt and permanent structures began uh, being seen on the land around the 1870s. Hunt brought Burnham Yards Railroad to the area and many working class immigrant communities began building homes uh, so they could live within walking distance of their work. Next slide, please. Uh, just to give you an idea of the homes and what the neighborhood feels like and looks like, I wanted to show you some of the images uh, of the various different architectural styles seen throughout the district and throughout La Alma Lincoln Park. The most original residences of the district are single-story cottages and modest versions of Italianate and Queen Anne architectural styles constructed between 1879 and 1889. 
Among other styles seen throughout the district are terrace, uh, Dutch Revival, Foursquare, Bungalow, Victorian cottages, and classic cottages. And these homes were mainly built in the late 19th century through the 1920s. The buildings were not built by recognized architects, but still reflect the popular architectural styles of their time in a simplified manner, making this vernacular architecture, among many other reasons. And this idea of vernacular architecture played a key role in the discussion of the custom design guidelines. Next slide, please. Uh, jumping ahead to the mid-century history of the neighborhood, Chicano, uh, the Chicano movement. Uh, this was a key piece of the history of this neighborhood and of course Denver as well. The Chicano movement represents the convergence of independent issues, land rights, labor rights, long-term discrimination, opposition to the Vietnam War, civil rights as embodied in the civil rights movement, with cultural identity, lack of equity in education, and inadequacy of the dominant political institutions to represent or address Chicano Chicana issues. The Law Oma Lincoln Park homes were safe havens where Chicano movement organizers and supporters lived, worked, and gathered. Uh, the movement grew out of a number of inequitable, inequitable circumstances that pushed Latinos, Hispanos, and Mexican-Americans uh, communities across the country to push for change to government and systems. The increased activism led to high school walkouts uh, that began in LA in 1968. This helped spark the blowout at Denver's West High School of March of 1969, with marches from um, the school to Lincoln Park through the neighborhood. And as you can see here, a, a still image of a documentary of the uh, West High blowout. This was right in front of Smith's Chapel, where br police brutality um, really began in that area, right near the school. Um, and in a moment, I'll show a map of kind of that general route through the neighborhood. Emmanuel Martinez sparked the mural movement at the same time. He saw the power in creating Chicano murals to inspire his culture in the neighborhood where he lived, La Alma Lincoln Park. And the first Chicano mural, as you can see here on the slide and on the bottom, is uh, titled La Alma, painted on the then Lincoln Park tool shed. The tool shed was demolished and so was the mural itself at that time. He then, eight years later, painted the current day La Alma mural that is on the current day rec center and was on my first slide and we'll talk a lot about um, in my slides as well as Lucha's slides here coming up. Next slide, please. And this is just a general route from West High to the park. So you can really see that the Chicano movement, this neighborhood was really the heart of the movement. Um, and many activities and protests happened right here. Also going on at the same time was the city of Denver decided that the town of Auraria, north of La Alma Lincoln Park, as you can see on the left-hand map, uh, kind of north of that 70 street uh, line, in their eyes was what they said was blighted. It would be the location of the new higher education campus. The city forced out hundreds of families from their homes, many who relocated to La Alma Lincoln Park, as well as the north side and other areas of the city. And I should also note that the west side of town, this area, um, as well as a couple other surrounding neighborhoods, was just one of the redlined areas identified by the discriminatory maps created by the Homeowners Loan Corporation Act of 1933. These maps resulted in inequitable housing and financial policies that were both punishing and manipulative in redlined neighborhoods uh, for decades to come. Because of this deep and complex history of the neighborhood and many individuals who still live in La Alma Lincoln Park, as well as outside of La Alma Lincoln Park, but um, may you know may not live right in this direct area, but still really consider this home. Uh, we, it was vital to engage all of these uh, different individuals to tell the firsthand accounts of this time period. Next slide, please. And I did want to note there are modern architectural styles in the district. Um, here are two examples with Denver Inner City Parish on the right, which was built in 1966 in a neo-mansard style. And then the Mariposa Health Clinic uh, featured on the left that was uh, designed and built in 1976 in a Pueblo Deco architectural style. There are a, a few architectural uh, architect built and designed um, buildings in this neighborhood. And um, I think it's also key to understand the very long uh, and complex history of this neighborhood. Next slide, please. So you can really now see the many layers of history of the neighborhood from the tribe, uh, the native tribes to the early permanent settlement history to the mid-century Chicano movement. 
And to understand these layers when working on the district effort, it had to be viewed through a very large period of significance. We pushed the envelope in terms of the traditional way of looking at architectural integrity as well as the period of significance. Uh, the POS established for this district spans a century from 1873 to 1980 to capture the full story of this place. Second, due to the long POS, the lens used to evaluate the integrity was broad, honoring uh, the changes and modifications that had taken place in the 20th century, uh, which gained their own significance through time. And as you can see here on the screen, the blue home has a porch that was enclosed a little later on after it was initially built. And then the Italianate yellow uh, home to the left, uh, on the upper left, that had an addition of a porch, and then that porch was enclosed, and then a second story deck um, built on top of that. And then the lower image, actually, you can see changes of fence materials even as well. So many different physical layers, not only the history layers, but the physical layers can be seen on these buildings. And it was really important to preserve in this effort. Uh, next slide. And here you can just see um, uh, the outline boundary of the district. It, this includes 194 uh, homes, as well as the park itself. It was vital to include the park in the district boundaries. And next slide. Uh, there was a group of neighbors from La Alma Lincoln Park that knew the neighborhood had a special history. They appreciated its buildings and close-knit culture and were concerned it could be lost based on what was happening and, uh, in other neighborhoods of the city. Not knowing the full depth of history in La Alma Lincoln Park, they wanted to uncover this story and determine if the, there was enough interest in preserving the neighborhood through a historic district tool. A handful of neighbors reached out to Historic Denver and asked if their project to research the history of their neighborhood would fit within the Action Fund program, and it did. The Action Fund program at Historic Denver is a small funding source to kickstart community-driven projects that include things like districts, design overlays, historic context, uh, as well as educational signage. And uh, currently we have a project in partnership with Lucha Martinez de Luna and the Chicano, Chicano Murals of Colorado project to figure out ways to preserve uh, Chicano murals. So uh, in 2016, the group applied to Historic Denver's Action Fund and the project was awarded funding. This funding was applied to hiring ultimately two consultants to do research on the neighborhood's history, conducting oral interviews, as well as assembling information into a robust historic context spanning from 1870s to 1980. Uh, it also updated the individual ind building forms uh, for uh, all the buildings in the district. The co second consultant was actually brought in uh, from within the Chicano Chicana community to fill in the gaps of the stories being collected and told in the historic context. Next slide. You can see here examples of one of the flyers that we had for one of the community meetings. We always had the flyers in English and Spanish. And uh, the Action Fund partnership between the neighbors and Historic Denver provided the neighbors technical assistance throughout the project. So that included community outreach engagement, things like coordinating community meetings, uh, coordinating flyerings, uh, printing the flyers, as well as collecting uh, a data of information to uh, to collect for um, the effort. And I also want to note that we provided, we tried to break down as many barriers as possible, and we always had translators as well as childcare at our meetings. Next slide. Over the course of five years, the community members worked with Historic Denver, consultants, neighborhood associations, and the city to strategize ways to protect and honor the cultural heritage of the neighborhood. To identify the right approach, the groups hosted meetings and listening sessions to collect stories and discuss ways to honor the neighborhood's heritage. Next slide. Through these sessions, the community said they wanted the home spaces and Chicano murals in La Alma Lincoln Park honored and preserved to avoid both loss of identity and loss of place that anchored the neighborhood. To help preserve the neighborhood while providing greater flexibility and equity in the process, the city worked with the community to create custom design guidelines. And these custom design guidelines also address the vernacular architectural styles uh, seen and the physical layers seen on the buildings that gain their own significance through time. Next slide. The first historic cultural district um, was uh, the La Alma Lincoln Park was the first historic cultural district to honor the Chicano movement uh, in Denver. And there were at least 30 community members at the city council public hearing who spoke in support of this district and just a couple images of some of those community meetings uh, or community members as well as us at the city council itself. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Shannon, for sharing your work. Um, we appreciate sharing all of the great, fantastic work that you and Historic Denver, the community did. Next, we'll hear from Lucha Martinez de Luna. Lucha is an archeologist specializing in Mesoamerica and contemporary archeology. span she serves as Associate Curator of Latino Heritage at History Colorado and is a PhD student at the University of California, Los Angeles. Lucha is also the Executive Director of the Chicano Chicana Chicanx Murals of Colorado Project, a grassroots organization that advocates for protecting historical and legacy community murals in Colorado. Lucha, I'll pass it on to you. Hi, my name is Lucha Martinez de Luna. I am the director of the Chicano Chicana Chicanx Murals of Colorado project. Uh, today I will be talking to you a little bit about um, the actions we have been taking to preserve historic Chicano murals in Colorado. So just a little bit of background about the Chicano Murals of Colorado project. It is a consortium of scholars specializing in archaeology, art history, and social anthropology. Um, artists and community members uh, working together to protect, preserve, and promote the visual legacy of Colorado. Um, we started this grassroots uh, organization in 2018. However, um, in the early 2000s, uh, I essentially began to um, document murals that I remember um, essentially growing up in, a, in these neighborhoods uh, that were painted in the early 70s, I started uh, realizing that a lot of them were um, starting to be erased at a very rapid rate. So I started working with some of the artists to, um, I did oral histories and started collecting some of their archives to hopefully preserve this um, very, very important visual legacy in our community. Um, we meet uh, every once in a while with the artists. There's been a few opportunities to have a few um, exhibits that CMCP has curated. And also we've had several um, meetings discussing how to move forward with uh, bridging the younger generations with the older generation of muralists in Colorado. So just a little bit of background. Um, community murals are essentially, uh, are essentially what we would call permanent. Um, they, they're paintings that are directly um, painted on a um, permanent structure. And why this is so significant is because it, it becomes actually uh, very important to create some kind of criteria as we move forward to preserve these murals. Um, the murals, there's a lot of uh, right now uh, murals that are portable murals that are not necessarily part of this, uh, this uh, project because of the fact that they are portable and they are not as um, at risk as much as the the murals that were painted on permanent structures. So I always like to point that out when as I move forward um, discussing the murals in this um, in this project that we consider at risk. Um, Murals were created uh, in communities. A lot of uh, the murals were in historically marginalized communities. Um, and they were a way to give a sense of permanence uh, in, in a neighborhood and in the landscape. And also it was a way for the community to claim a sense of uh, ownership in in a lot of these communities where they were redlined and it was very difficult for um, families to um, get mortgages to purchase their homes. So there was a lot of sense of impermanence in, in these communities. So the murals allowed communities to fill a sense of space and place within their neighborhoods. And a lot of these murals, they are visual text, really account, uh, accounting the local and regional histories in, um, in specifically in Colorado, but also in, um, in the country. Um, as I mentioned before, the sense of permanence. Uh, 
I I actually have a, a personal connection to the murals. Um, my father uh, and mother were very active during the civil rights movement, and um, in, in addition to their activism, they were also very instrumental in um, bringing murals to the community. Um, my father was uh, worked in, in uh, with three different movements that was happening in in, in Colorado and um, New Mexico with the land rights movement with Reyes Lopez Tijerina and in California with Cesar Chavez and the United Farm Workers. Um, Early on, he was creating a lot of protest art, and then later, um, after traveling to Mexico to do an apprenticeship with uh, David Alfaro Siqueiros on a very large project he was working on in the Poly Forum in Mexico City, he returned to Denver in 1968 and created uh, one of the uh, created a mural in a um, what was a crusade for justice building that was where uh, a lot of activism was happening in Denver and it was in the uh, conference room or banquet of the the building and that was his first real uh, permanent mural and as I mentioned before portable murals were created before but this was really the very beginning of bringing muralism to communities. And shortly after that, he moved into the Lama um, neighborhood. And this is actually a picture of one of the first uh, community murals created at Lama Park. And as I mentioned before, it was very important to at this time to really kind of claim uh, a sense of permanence in these spaces. A lot of uh, parks and swimming pools, even though they were in the neighborhoods, they were very restricted in terms of access and very heavily monitored by the police. So this was an opportunity to, to really um, feel a part of um, the spaces that they lived in and they did that through muralism. And once again, as I mentioned, the community ownership, feeling, feeling a part of the community also meant that they had a say in, in what was happening in the parks and the swimming pools. Uh, a lot of these swimming pools, they were restricted in terms of who could swim in the pools and at what days. So what essentially the community started demanding is that they had not only access but that they could work in um, the recreation centers and in the pools and this image is essentially some of the early lifeguards that were hired and the community that that were getting involved in their public spaces and in the backdrop, you can see um, some of the murals that my father created at um, several of the city parks in, um, in 1970. And then once again, this sense of space. Um, in this particular um, picture, this is the mural by Carlota Espinosa, painted in 1976 at Our Lady of Guadalupe Church. Our Lady of Guadalupe Church was not only um, a church, but also a, a place for the community to to have discussions about a lot of, a lot of social justice movements that were going on. Um, this was the headquarters for the United Farm Workers in Colorado. And in addition to that, there was a lot of mural activism happening here. There was approximately 13 murals painted on the interior and exterior of this uh, of the church. And unfortunately, all of these murals have been erased. And the only one left is the mural that you see here that is currently behind a wall. And when, once again, I mentioned this importance of visual text where uh, this is, becomes very critical during the civil rights movement where communities are demanding that they are included in the re local and regional narratives that are describing the history of this country and of the state. Um, specifically, uh, 
people of color were rarely recognized in these um, histories in in the curriculum and in textbooks. So the way the community response responded and artists is they became storytellers in their community where they started creating the history and and telling stories of the history through muralism. So some of these murals are very complex because our history is complex and they become very inclusive, uh, describing the diversity of this country. So here you see some details. Uh, this mural is painted in Pueblo of the beginning of Pueblo. And uh, in fact, Pueblo was, um, was the border between Mexico and the United States. And this is kind of remembering that history. And uh, from the very beginning, because a lot of these murals were painted in red line communities and in historically marginalized communities, many of these murals were not really considered important. Um, so they have been very much at risk even though they are a work of art and a historical to visual text, they are still very much at risk. And um, a lot of times these murals were created, um, a lot of uh, the community and actually uh, business owners and nonprofit organizations help fund a lot of these murals. But what's interesting is that even though they were very much celebrated and considered part of the community, when these murals are erased, there's no conversation with the community. And that is what is so disturbing about the erasure of these murals. Um, this mural that we're seeing here was the largest mural painted in, um, in Colorado in 1978. And the, to the far right is the Sun Valley Homes, where a lot of the youth help, that lived in these homes helped paint the mural. And they could see this mural across from their home. And uh, in the early 1990s, um, there was a new building owner um, and he approached the city of Denver to let them know that the mural had been partially tagged and asked how he could um, fix it. And the city of Denver came to this, uh, the location and essentially painted over the mural. So once again, this, uh, this lack of respect for these artworks in the community. And this was another mural that was very much cherished in the community. And during quarantine in 2019, I started receiving calls one morning. Um, the community was reaching out to the Chicano Murals of Colorado project to let them know that the paint, the mural was being painted over. And by the time I got to the site, um, it, uh, the image on the right is what I saw. It just within, uh, within uh, 30 minutes, an hour, this mural was completely painted over. And once again, this was a very much cherished mural in the community painted by David Ocelotto Garcia, who um, this was his very first mural and painted by youth in the community. So this was an opportunity for the first time to really um, confront the people responsible for painting over this mural and really to try to agree on how we could um, to possibly restore the mural. And fortunately, we reached an agreement and rapidly looked for solutions to restore this mural. Um, this, as I mentioned before, the Our Lady of Guadalupe Church had several murals uh, on the exterior of the building. Uh, this was one painted by Carlos Sandoval on the left. And this mural describes really the settlement uh, of San Luis, which was the first town um, established in the state of Colorado, and it was established by Hispanos. Mexican Americans and, and what we now call also call Chicanos uh, in the mid 1800s. Now this is a very important history and this mural is describing this here's history and to the right you can see how the wall looks today. 
Now the mural we see at Bochley, what we decided to do, the one that was uh, whitewashed during quarantine was to, um, we had heard about this, uh, another organization in Los Angeles called the Social Pop Public Art Resource Center that have been bringing back murals that have been erased, essentially whitewashed in, in LA. So David, um, the artist, went to LA to learn the technique and he came back to Denver. And these are images of us uh, essentially bringing, taking off the white paint and bringing back this mural, this much, uh, this very cherished mural. And this is the first time that we have ever done this in Denver. So it was really an incredible experience to see this mural come back. And we intend to do this with a, a few other legacy murals that have been painted or over, including the one that I mentioned that was painted in 1978. Uh, we are currently uh, working towards and doing uh, fundraising to try and bring back that mural as well. And another big part of what uh, CMCP does is uh, building awareness. Uh, the only way that we can save these murals and protect them is to do precisely what I'm doing today, is talking about these murals and explaining how important it is to pr preserve them. Um, we also do uh, work with students integrating um, the, the murals into their history classes and into their literature classes. We have found that um, students very much like to learn history visually and when they can actually walk to a mural in their neighborhood and look at this history, it's, it's very powerful for them, especially because they see themselves in these murals. So we really like to um, make these murals accessible to students in the community that want to learn more about them. And uh, a, an amazing thing that happened to us at the very beginning of this year is uh, last year I applied to the National Trust's 11 Most Endangered Places to try and get the, the murals of Colorado on this listing. And they were actually selected by the National Trust. So this is the very first time in the nation that murals have been recognized um, by the National Trust. And of course, this elevates the importance of these murals and also the, the very much uh, re the reality that they are very much at risk. And um, this designation is essentially for approximately 40 murals throughout the state of Colorado. And one thing that we are also doing, uh, we have a website and we are asking the community to reach out on the website to let us know of murals in their community that they would like to see on this list. So um, I highly encourage you to visit us on our website. And thank you very much for listening to the presentation and joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your incredible and important work, Lucha. We really appreciate it. For our last presentation, I'm delighted to introduce two speakers who will share their collaborative work on Route 66, Kaiza Barthuli and Dr. Angelica Sanchez-Clark, both with the National Park Service. Kaiza Barthuli has worked with the National Park Service for 30 years in cultural resource management. She manages the Route 66 Corridor Preservation Program, where she works with various entities, such as private, nonprofit, and government to help develop strategies for interpretation, conservation, and management of the 2400 mile historic road. We also have Dr. Angelica Sanchez Clark, who joined the National Trails Office of the National Park Service in 2014. She previously worked for the Spanish Colonial Research Center, a partnership with the National Park Service. She is the co-editor of the Historic Route 66 and New Mexican Crossroads, Essays on the Hispanic Heritage of Old Highway 66. 
her work with the NPS National Trails. It centers on historical research and community outreach to underrepresented and underserved Hispanic and other traditional communities along the National Historic Trails. So with that, I will pass it on to my colleagues. Hello, and thank you, Shannon and Lucha, for sharing your projects with us. And thank you, National Trust, for this opportunity to share ours. I am Kaisa Barthuli. I live and work on the lands of the Tewa people, and I have the privilege of managing the National Park Service Route 66 Corridor Preservation Program. I'm here with my wonderful colleague, Angelica Sanchez-Clark, who is lead historian for our office, and in our presentation, I will be sharing some background and context for the project while Angelica will talk more in depth about the project itself. So the Route 66 program launched in 2002 to provide financial and technical resources for preserving the places and stories of Route 66. We work along the entire length of the road through eight states from Chicago to Santa Monica and all of our work is done through partnering, partnering with those who live and work along the road or own and manage its many, many parts. Since the beginning of the program, we recognize that many of the common narratives or themes of Route 66 have focused on things like car culture, the family vacation, colonial perspectives of indigenous and Hispanic culture, and the American dream, among others. When we look more closely at the road as an icon of 20th century America, however, we know that Route 66 can tell us so much more about the complex social, racial, political, economic, and other values and events of its time that are really important, critical to understanding our lives and society today. In 2012, we partnered with World Monuments Fund, Rutgers University, and American Express to undertake an economic impact study that included demographic research. What the data showed is that American Indian people live along the route at three times the national average, and Hispanic people live along the route at twice the national average. In other aspects of the study, however, we learned that visitors and travelers on Route 66 are 97% white and non-Hispanic. What this told us is that while American Indian and Hispanic presence is strong along the route, heritage tourism and other interests related to Route 66 have been primarily white and non-Hispanic. This reality is often reflected in the imagery and visual iconography of Route 66 as well. One of the key conclusions of the study was that there is major potential to better synthesize the celebration of Route 66 with the history and culture of Hispanics and American Indians. As a result, a pro program priority became partnering with American Indian, Hispanic, Black, and other communities in the history and storytelling of Route 66, with one of these projects being the Hispanic legacies of Route 66. The goal of this project has been to use traditional historical research as well as community engagement to shine light on the undertold stories of the roles that Hispanic people played in the history and development of Route 66, culminating in an online ArcGIS story map interpretive presentation. And Helica will take it from here to share more about the project. And Helica. Thank you, Kaisa. So in 2015, the National Park Service partnered with the Environment for the Americas and the Hispanic Access Foundation to create the Latino Heritage Internship Program, which we refer to as LHIP. This program aims to engage the next generation of conservation stewards while raising awareness of the need for Latino involvement in the preservation of national parks and historic sites. From 2015 to 2017, the National Trails Office was selected to host two LHIP interns, both University of New Mexico students. Lena Guidi and Gianna May Sanchez, both born and raised in New Mexico, served as Route 66 Hispanic Heritage Study interns. During her internship, Lena visited and interviewed Hispanic community members across New Mexico.
capturing their Route 66 experiences. After countless hours of primary and secondary research, Lena produced a 34-page report that narrated the experiences of these New Mexican Route 66 communities. For her internship program, titled Sharing Our History, Hispanic Legacies of Route 66, Gianna used her background in Latino history, community outreach, and digital media to work with Lena's data and research to develop an initial story map. During her 10-week internship, Gianna also had the opportunity to meet with Route 66 community members in New Mexico to ensure that their Route 66 experiences were reflected in the final project. Throughout the projects, we also partnered with UNM's Spanish Colonial Research Center, directed by Do Dr. Joseph Sanchez. One outcome of that partnership was a 2017 anthology in which Lena's research findings were published. During their internships, Lena and Gianna traveled to Tucumcari, Santa Rosa, Moriarty, Los Lunas, Grants, and Gallup to meet with community members who were eager to share their Route 66 experiences. Kaiza and I were able to make this initial outreach because of our professional and personal connections. So through the Route 66 Quarter Preservation Program and the Route 66 Oral History Project undertaken in partnership with UNM, Kaiza had gained the trust of many of the people Lena and Gianna met with and interviewed. And my own family's connections to Route 66 through my father, Luis G. Sanchez, resulted in a wonderful meeting in Santa Rosa with community members that had worked, lived, and owned businesses along Route 66. We had a similar positive experience in Los Lunas, where we met with staff and community members at the Los Lunas Museum of Heritage and Arts. Everywhere we went, we encountered people that were eager to share their often overlooked stories and connections to Route 66. These are people who know their history, and they're just waiting for an opportunity uh, to be given to them to share their stories with us. This project, like many community-based preservation projects, is all about building trust. We went to the communities we went to their suggested meeting places. We were able to share a meal with them and engage them in conversation. So even though Lena and Gianna had a set of questions to help frame the interviews, we made sure to give the people we were meeting with time to share their photos, memorabilia, documentation, and stories. So I'd like to spend a little bit of time describing what a story map actually is. A story map is a digital platform for sharing stories as they relate to the places where the story happened through maps, GIS point data, photographs, videos, oral histories, and more. It allowed us to touch on the complex history about the indigenous and Hispanic roots of the Southwest and to try to connect that past to the coming of the automobile and Route 66. That proved to be challenging because we had to find a balance between honoring those multi-layered histories without losing our audience. And so here, I'm gonna demonstrate just the first few moments of the story map. So after the introductory information, the story map begins with context and background on traditional Hispanic culture in New Mexico, using photos, narrative, and videos. It then moves on to talk about transportation routes leading up to Route 66 through GIS map technology to help with understanding the evolution and relationship of historic trails and roads to each other. The other story map sections include No Easy Road, New Transportation, New Opportunities, Making Connections, Misconceptions, The Coming of Interstate 40, and Legacy. And I also want to touch on terminology. 
Throughout the project, we struggled with whether to use Latino, Latina, Latinx, or Hispanic. We settled on using, using Hispanic because most people in New Mexico use it widely when they self-identify, along with the term Spanish and Hispano. So we included an explanation about terminology at the beginning of the story map, along with more information and resources at the beginning, at the end, for those that were interested in learning more. Respecting how, and more importantly, why people self-identify in these types of projects is key to gaining the trust that we talked about earlier. Some common themes that emerged throughout the projects included Route 66 as an economic lifeline, encounters with new people, and human connections. Route 66 connected rural New Mexico to the outside world, especially during World War II. New Mexican residents were able to diversify their work and access new forms of income, including buying gas stations and restaurants along Route 66. It also brought New Mexican residents into contact with many new people traveling through New Mexico. Because Hispanics and American Indians were often presented as tourism spectacles, interactions between travelers and locals often resulted in cultural misconceptions and stereotyping. In interviews with Ralph Moya and others, for example, they shared that travelers um, often asked them what it was like to live in Mexico, uh, asked them if they spoke English, and asked them if they went to school. Many of them were children at the time that this happened, and they expressed feeling uncomfortable and really not being sure how to respond to these uh, travelers and tourists. But these encounters also highlighted what New Mexicans had in common with people traveling on Route 66, especially during the Dust Bowl era. Many Hispanics identified with those fleeing their homes, suffering from hunger, trying to survive. In Santa Rosa, they often told these travelers where they could fish and bathe in the many surrounding lakes and help them with car repairs. Throughout this project, the theme of adaptation and survival was a constant one. Hispanic residents living on or near Route 66 adjusted and transformed their ways of living to take advantage of new forms of transportation, commerce, and tourism. In this clip, Albert Gallegos, a 15-year-old boy at the time from a ranch near Tucumcari, describes how he and his cousin often went to Tucumcari to play for tourists. When this automobile club would come through, they would have almost all of the hotel motels booked. Of course, in the evenings and at night, they used to have some really good parties in their, yeah. in their, in their rooms. So, A.B. and I would go from room to room with our guitars playing, and we would play for tips. Even after uh, the road was bypassed and decommissioned, many living in these towns continued to conduct business as usual to serve locals and tourists interested in exploring Route 66 as an American experience. And hopefully with projects such as this one, tourists and travelers will also learn about the communities and people that were here long before the advent of the automobile and about their contributions to historic Route 66. And so this is just sharing a link to the actual story map. And this is uh, Kaiser's and mine contact information. Thank you very much. Thank you both so much for sharing um, your work, this community preservation work happening along Route 66. We really appreciate it. Um, so with with that behind us, I would love to ask you all a few questions, if that's okay with you. Um, but first, I want to thank you again for sharing your projects, your passion, and for helping us rethink new ways on how to approach the preservation of Latinx heritage. Um, so Shannon, I would love to open this up to you first. Um, can, 
Can you talk a little bit about one key challenge you faced during your project? Yes, definitely. Thanks for asking that. Uh, mural protection was our key challenge working through the Law Malikam Park Historic Cultural District. Uh, we did work very closely with Lucha uh, and the Chicano Chicano Murals of Colorado project. And if you could show slide 15, please. Just to give a visual reference of the two murals within the district boundaries, these two murals um, were key components to our conversations about murals and how to preserve these. Uh, so. Right now, the city views murals as paint, and the city's preservation landmark ordinance does not include paint in the landmark purview of protecting and, and preservation. So therefore, in their current policy, they cannot protect murals because they are viewed as paint. And it seems so simple, but that is, you know, the way the ordinance is written. Um, so despite this limitation, though, with um, the ordinance, we had numerous conversations and discussions throughout the effort with the city, Lucha, Historic Denver, and the community um, to determine how to protect murals in the district. While conversations were unable to identify specific tools to physically preserve the murals at this time, it is creating more awareness of their importance and provides additional platforms to continue to problem solve on how to preserve these heritage murals. But one aspect I do want to note, uh, we were able to complete during this district effort, we were, we were able to recognize these two specific murals as character defining features of the district, which again elevates their significance and puts pressure on the city to figure out policy to actually physically protect and preserve these murals. So that's just the one key um, challenge that we face for the district. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Um, Dr. Sanchez Clark or Kaisa, I wonder if you can reflect on one key challenge that you faced as um, you were working um, throughout any of these projects on Route 66. Sure, I, I can respond. So one of the key challenges that we encountered early on was the complexity of Hispanic identity. So as Lena began her research, she quickly discovered that census data did not differentiate be uh, among Hispanic identities. And while she was researching business directories, she discovered that surnames were often not the best way to identify Hispanic business owners. Some Hispanics have Anglo or Middle Eastern surnames, and, but they identify as Hispanic. And some American Indians have Spanish surnames. So uh, she really had to figure out how to go around actually identifying the people that uh, she wanted to meet with and to make sure that she wasn't overlooking um, any of those uh, community members. Um, we also quickly discovered that many Hispanics in New Mexico identif identify very strongly with their Spanish European heritage, and they often self-identify as Spanish. But as a result, they will sometimes distance themselves from more recent immigrants from Latin America. So we really try to find a way of balancing all that. Yeah, thank you for sharing. We appreciate that. And Lucha, I would love to hear one key challenge that you faced in working with the murals. Um, well, definitely, uh, Shannon alluded to some of that. Um, for me, as an archaeologist, suddenly going into this world of preservation, you would think that I would be more knowledgeable about it, but I'm working with prehistory. So um, when I started attending the meetings and quite honestly, when I heard for the first time how murals are classified in the preservation world in Denver was, um, it felt like a stab in the heart for me because I was, I, I grew up around these murals, the community um, cherishes them, they're a treasure for all of us. So moving beyond that and really trying to um, to teach uh, people that don't live in our community about the importance of these murals um, has, has, has been somewhat of a challenge, but at the same time too, um, many interesting conversations and a lot of interest in protecting these murals. Wow, yeah. Well, I have a follow-up question if you don't mind. I, I'd love to hear if you can, you can share what makes these murals so important and why they should be preserved. Well, as I mentioned before in, in the presentation to the community, these are really historical textbooks for us because we didn't have access 
to these stories. And it's, it's not just Chicanos, it's not just Hispanos, it's um, all communities of colors, uh, color did not have access to their stories. And these murals do not just reflect uh, the Chicano Hispano heritage, it's the heritage of uh, Colorado. So I think that that is, is, is really important because you're not, you don't have to go into a museum to see this history it's just in your community. It's it's accessible to all. Absolutely, that's fantastic. Thank you. Great. Well, I have one other question. I have a few other questions, but um, this question I would love to toss over to Kaiza and Dr. Sanchez Clark. Um, I'd love to hear what innovative tools um, you used or methodologies that you came across uh, when you were working on your projects. Thank you, Sayla. Um, I guess I guess you could say that the story map platform itself is somewhat innovative, um, maybe considered innovative in that it, it allowed us to ground the stories in place and land across space and time, um, which is so important in terms of trying to convey the complexity of, of of stories and and histories, um, and and it also just allowed us to share the stories in in a, a variety of ways that included like the actual voices of those who experienced it directly, um, and and so as a multimedia platform, it's very cool, and in fact was one of the reasons um, why our, the project was selected. Um, by the Organization of American Historians for their 2022 Award for Excellence in National Park Service History, which was, which was uh, really uh, an honor. Um, but that said, even as we tried to pick an innovative platform, we absolutely recognize that digital platforms are not always that accessible. You know, I mean, they 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 make things accessible, and on the other hand, you know, for those for elders who. Um, may not have access to, um, you know, digital technology, you know, they're the one and they, the, our elders are those who might be especially interested in these stories. So, you know, we, we recognize the barriers that, that it presents as well. Um, and just one other aspect of the project that I wouldn't say is necessarily innovative, but which is, is so critical is that um, the project um, attempted to prioritize, you know, the different perspectives and difficult subjects around racism and land appropriation, colonization, and indigenous histories and how indigenous histories are integral to Hispanic history in Route 66. Um, and how really, you know, how important indigenous histories are in, in, in relative to the fact that Hispanic and Route 66 histories are overlays to these much bigger stories. So, um, so yeah, those are some of the, the aspects that may be considered. Um, Great, thank you. Yeah, I totally feel, you know, the GIS problem. Sometimes I feel the same way. It changes so much day to day, uh, but I love story maps and I loved um, playing around on all of the work that you did. And just, I did find it to be so innovative and creative. So we appreciate you sharing that. Um, so Shannon, I would love to invite you to share anything that you came across that you felt like were innovative tools for your toolbox as you were working um, on your project. Yeah, so definitely the custom design guidelines would be the one uh, one of the innovative tools that we used in the district effort. Uh, in talking with the community, we really heard they wanted flexibility in how materials on their homes were preserved. And, um, you know, we talked with the city about how to address that desire to preserve certain aspects of the neighborhood that may not be allowed in traditional uh, historic districts, such as use of vinyl windows or perma stone siding. Uh, and it was important to the neighborhood, but also the city to honor these layers through the creation of the custom design guidelines. Um, the layers of materials gain their own significance through time, especially on you know vernacular buildings when the buildings reflect the economies and uh, the needs of the people. So the idea of vernacular became a key piece and a key component in this discussion of custom design guidelines. Um, and I like to just kind of 
you know, we all have our own idea of the definition of vernacular, but we brought um, the Encyclopedia of Vernacular Architecture of the World, a quote from that in the district effort and the conversation of this, uh, is all forms of vernacular architecture are built to meet the specific needs, accommodating the values, economies, and ways of life of the cultures that produce them. So not only was vernacular styles important in the creation of the custom design guidelines, but it also played into one of the criterion. Um, so we have 10 criteria that a district can be designated for. Uh, we need to meet three out of 10. And uh, that was for this district. The district represents an error of culture or heritage that allows an understanding of how the site was used by past generations. So these different approaches and ways of thinking about the district really all came together in innovative ways. Yeah, I, I love that and allowing community feeling and the value that community has for these places to lead with that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, thanks for sharing. But Lucia, um, can you share any types of innovative tools that you found that were successful um, where, as you were working with your projects um, throughout Colorado? Uh, definitely, probably two that were really, really helpful is really um, having these um, spaces where we could um, talk to the artists and hear about all of their concerns. But at the same time, too, um, we created, uh, we curated two exhibitions where we were celebrating um, muralism in Colorado. So we reached um, a lot of people, larger audience, and we were able to be in this space all together and really, uh, really, really highlighting um, the significance of these murals. And of course, by doing that, we were able to, to promote the murals through um, not only social media, but also in uh, traditional media. So that was very helpful for us. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to move on to my next question regarding outreach. Um, so we know that community outreach is such a key component in building trust and trust building as we're doing our work. I would um, invite you to share how it is that you worked on building trust um, and how your outreach in the community was handled and how you did that. And Shannon, I will invite you to go first. So yeah, Historic Denver and the community members that were really leading the effort took a methodical approach to really build and foster community relationships. We really took the time to understand the dynamics of the community first before jumping in to build those relationships too. Um, and, and the groups that made, um, that make up that we so we made sure that the engagement was successful um, and really that built relationships that would last well past this district effort um, which in the end makes long lasting relationships with the community and really a key piece of the outreach for the district was also including residents you know that lived in the district boundaries but also those that lived in the city or in the denver metro area that still considered la alma lincoln park home but no longer lived there that was a huge key piece of our outreach and always inviting them to all the community meetings the custom design guideline net, uh working groups all of that even city council at the end um, and another key piece was our uh, hosting community meeting uh, listening sessions asking the community to come and tell us their stories what history they thought was important for us to hear for about the neighborhood and then also what spaces and areas of the neighborhood were important to them and there was also a lot of hand delivered flyers um, we did a lot of you know door-to-door -door outreach as well and I think one key piece at the very end, when the individual building inventory forms were completed, we printed each of those. And that was um, for every single building in the district. And we put that in an overall package that talked about the historical cultural district, what it was, what it meant, and then also a summary of the history of the neighborhood and put that as a package and delivered it again that to door to door um, so that they had that information about their home and about the neighborhood as a whole. So kind of customizing that outreach and engagement um, as well. Great. Thank you. Yeah, Lucia, can you share on building trust in your work with the community? Yeah, well, for this one, uh, I think what is really key here and very critical is to really have local, that it really, our, our organization is very much grassroots. And what I mean by that is that I, we, I am part of this community and being part of the community, you already have that trust, you have that knowledge. And I, I strongly feel that 
um, as we expand in throughout the nation, we really need to acknowledge that, that we have our storytellers in our community and we have our histories that even though we haven't been able to have it on and these kind of platforms or even in the preservation world that it's there. And if we have working, we're working with local um, uh, storytellers, then it, it's just going to be that more powerful. And the community already will feel part of it from the very beginning instead of outside um, entities coming in and saying, you know, we want to do this. I, I think there's we're, we're at this really critical point where we, we need to acknowledge that we need to work with these communities because they've been doing it for a long time. They just haven't been hurt. Yeah. yeah. That's so well said, Lucha. Thank you. Um, I absolutely agree. Um, thank you. So um, let's see here. Kaiza and Dr. Sanchez Clark, can you share on your work on building trust um, within the outreach in your communities? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I, I, Lucha and Shannon, I, I think we identify so much with everything that you just shared with us about building trust. So in our, you know, in our presentation, we touched on how through the Route 66 corridor preservation program, we already had uh, many established connections in these communities. Kaiza and her predecessor had spent a lot of time on the road traveling to these communities, and they worked really hard to build these relationships with community members. Uh, we also had other connections with trail partners through the National Historic Trails that we administer. So for example, several of the partners that worked at the Los Lunas Museum also volunteered to work with El Camino Real de Tierra Adentro. And so they were more than willing to meet with Lena, Gianna, and with us to discuss the history of Route 66 in that community, as well as about its historic um, connections to the Camino. Um, and I touched on um, my family connections, but I think it just underscores how important it can be to build on uh, already established relationships. And I think it helped that Lena and Gianna were from New Mexico. And so when they went to these communities in New Mexico, the people there kind of just took them under, you know, under their arms and 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 they they were eager to share with you know these young women a part of their history and so that was really cool to see uh but we did want to share that in a later phase of the overall project kaisa and lena actually did encounter some trust issues in amarillo texas um, they discovered that a lot of recent business owners from Latin America had actually taken over some of these vacated um, Route 66 businesses, the buildings. And so these business owners, they weren't necessarily familiar with Route 66. And some of them showed a little bit of distrust, like wondering who they were, you know, who are these two people from the government that were asking them questions? You know, they're there trying to run a business. And so they weren't necessarily eager to answer a bunch of questions. So we definitely have more work to do there. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, great. So I would like to think about the future and you know, consider how it is that these projects in the community look moving forward. So I would like to start with Lucha, if you don't mind reflecting on how it is that communities are, are going to be benefiting from the murals and how it is that the community will live alongside of these projects moving forward. Well, uh, definitely um, over the past month, this is where we're finally seeing results. Um, we are covering murals with this uh, mural shield clear coating and then for the first time what I call resurrecting a mural has been so powerful for our community and so we're just continuing to do that where we're bringing back some of these murals, we're protecting them, putting plaques on them and then the next step is okay, how do we get landmark status for these murals and that National Register changing how preservationists think about murals, especially here in Denver, where they're still considered paint on a wall. And that just blows my mind. <laughs> but uh, that, those are the next steps. And I really feel confident that it's going to happen fairly quickly. And of course, National Trust, um, their support in, in this um, 
as we move forward, the path forward is, is really going to be powerful for us. Absolutely. We will be crossing our fingers for you and supporting you in these next steps. Um, so I'd love to pass, pass this on over to Kaiza and Dr. Sanchez-Clark and just learn what's in the future and how the communities will be benefiting from this work moving forward. Thank you, Sela. And um, honestly, this is where we have work to do. Um, our, our final project release was delayed due to the pandemic and there was a temporary hold on story maps in the National Park Service due to technological issues. And so there has been a, a real lag in reconnecting with community members since the research phase of the project and also since the launch of the, the actual story map since last October. Um, and so we are thinking about, you know, re-engaging um, and um, also planning a phase two. And uh, some of our ideas are to, and again, these are our ideas, are to dig deeper into the stories of the individual businesses and families um, along the road and to possibly develop a, a travel itinerary of sites, um, and also perhaps to identify places that are eligible for listing in the National Register um, as ways of potentially benefiting the owners, the property owners and the communities. Um, however, regardless of what uh, our ideas are, what will be most important for phase two is to um, engage with community members in the planning of what would interest and benefit them most. Um, and, um, and the larger effort, of course, is really about substantially and meaningfully expanding representation in the imagery, understanding, and storytelling of Route 66, so that as an icon of America, everyone can find themselves and their story there. Um, and also looking at how communities can reap more of the economic social and other benefits of Route 66 that um, um, they may not have historically. Um, so we've been in, in really good conversation with this about the national, with this, about this with the National Trust um, who designated Route 66 as a national treasure. Um, and we, we absolutely know that this will happen through relationships and looking to community members for the answers and for leadership. And it, it must be community informed, community built, community led, and involves building networks of resources and support. And it, it just can't be about throwing money at a few projects and moving on. Right, absolutely. Thank you. Great, and Shannon, we would love to hear your thoughts on how communities will be benefiting um, from this designation there in Denver. Yeah, so, you know, we're still learning how, what it's like to live with this project um, because it's so recent. It was actually designated a historic cultural district one year ago yesterday. So um, it is very exciting, but very recent too. So still learning um, kind of where we're going from, from this designation. Um, but I think what we are all saying um, to, uh, you know, each of our projects have kind of brought this to light is that it's important with projects like this, there's no end date um, and that our involvement in the community will ever be evolving with how we can support them and that what they would like to see. Um, so a couple ways that we still remain engaged with uh, Loma Lincoln Park and the community is, of course, our partnership with Chicano Chicano Murals of Colorado Project um, with not just the two murals within the district, but murals outside of the district in the greater Loma Lincoln Park neighborhood and then also outside um, in the greater Denver area and how to protect and preserve the murals um, through physical preservation and policy. Policy is the key thing that Lucha and I keep talking about in, in Denver and I think state why too. Obviously, there are murals across the state that policy needs to happen in terms of seeing the murals beyond just paint, um, that they are heritage pieces and sites that need to be preserved um, just as much as buildings. Uh, and there have been other ideas thrown out there from the community of things like signs around the neighborhood to talk about the history and talk about the Chicano movement and why the um, neighborhood is so important and special to the community and, and to really bring awareness to those stories. So some ideas thrown out there, but again, 
still work needs to be um, had. And, and of course, the ideas coming from the community themselves and not us putting it on them and working with the community to see where they want to kind of go from from here with this in this neighborhood. Great. Yeah, well, we can't wait to see what you do. Um, and we appreciate you sharing. Um, so with that, those are the end of my questions. I would like to thank each of you, our panelists, for inspiring us with this creative work and challenging us to think intentionally. I, I heard the word intentionally so many times, and that's so true. This work is intentional. Um, but I also want to thank you for helping us to think critically about preserving Latinx heritage. We also want to thank the National Trust for Historic Preservation for hosting this session. And with that, I'm gonna ask Phil to turn on the PowerPoint. Great. I'd like to invite each of you to reach out to us if you have any thoughts or questions about these specific projects on um, that you heard today or just in general Latinx heritage. Um, here's our contact information. Uh, we invite you to reach out, ask questions. We would love to connect to you. And our biggest thanks goes to our audience. We are grateful that you've joined us in this conversation. And we look forward to hearing all of the great work that you're doing with Latinx Heritage over the coming weeks. Thank you. <laughs>